All right, so let's get started with what is meta-analysis? So a meta-analysis is essentially a research method that is going to statistically summarize findings across a bed of existing literature. And the statistical summary that we end up with is called a summary effect size. And let's talk a little bit more about what a meta-analysis method of research is used for. Okay, so let's say that we have a question about what does all of the existing published literature say about a particular topic? And it helps us to then take all of that evidence and then synthesize it in an empirical way and make sense of it. And so when we go through this process, it can actually help with influencing how future research is going to be designed. And given that a meta-analysis reviews an area of literature in a comprehensive manner, oftentimes you'll find that the conclusions that the authors will offer are going to discuss future areas for research for primary studies. And you'll find that oftentimes there are going to be limitations that are noted in the analysis, and those are noted in order to improve upon future studies because meta-analysis is limited by the primary studies that are available to us, which we'll talk about in a few moments in more detail. So let's talk a little bit about the history of meta-analysis and where it came from. So it actually originated back in 1977 with the very first meta-analysis that was performed by Mary Smith and Jean Glass. And Glass coined the term meta-analysis. This is actually one of your readings for this week and it's pretty interesting to take a look at what were researchers interested in learning back in 1977? And so let's talk a little bit about what they found. So at the time that this was investigated, there was a popular question of whether or not therapy was effective. And so that's actually what they sought out to examine. And their results showed that counseling and psychotherapy demonstrated beneficial effects. And they found that they were, there were negligible differences in the effects produced by different types of therapy. And so, of course, the results were more complicated than that. But if we just think about it for a second, that's a really interesting concept of what was examined in the first ever meta-analysis. So following this first meta-analysis, we then began to see an increasing number of books that were starting to be published in the late 1980s. And then we started to see a boom in meta-analyses that started in the 1990s and have continued on to today. And even today, it's actually become an increasingly popular method of research in medicine. And the reason for that is because they are attempting to try and quickly summarize what's going on in a particular area in order to get a sense of whether or not there's mixed evidence for something and, and trying to understand better that mixed evidence. Um, or if it's not so mixed um, as research continues to come out and be updated. And so to give you a prime example of how this has become so important as a research method in medicine, Let's talk about an example here. So back in the 1950s, there was a best-selling book called Baby and Child Care, and this was written by Dr. Benjamin Spock. And in this book, he wrote, quote, I think it is preferable to accustom a baby to sleeping on his stomach from the beginning if he is willing. This statement was actually included in most editions of the book and in most of the 50 million copies that were sold between the 1950s and the 1990s. This advice was not unusual 
as most pediatricians made similar recommendations at the time. And during this same time frame, so from 1950 to 1990, more than 100,000 babies died of SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Okay. In the early 90s, researchers became aware that the risk of SIDS decreased by at least 50% when babies were put to sleep on their backs instead of face down. And governments in various countries launched educational initiatives such as the Back to Sleep campaigns in both the UK and the US. And that led to an immediate drop in the number of SIDS deaths that we were seeing. And so while more than 100,000 children lost is absolutely devastating, the worst tragedy is that many of these deaths could actually have been prevented with the use of systematic review. And so I'll leave you with this quote in the center of the slide here. Advice to put infants to sleep on the front for nearly half a century was contrary to evidence available from 1970 that this was likely to be harmful. Systematic review of preventable risk factors for SIDS from 1970 would have led to earlier recognition of the risks of sleeping on the front and might have prevented over 10,000 infant deaths in the UK and at least 50,000 in Europe, the USA, and Australasia. So quite a powerful example to start out the class. Okay, so nuts and bolts. Let's go over the broad aerial view of the main steps of the process of a meta-analysis. All right, so first we review the literature for relevant publications to include in the meta-analysis based on the question we have developed at hand that we have. Then all of those published articles have to come together in a likewise fashion. And oftentimes, not all of the same statistics are going to be used across articles. So there are some necessary conversions that have to take place in order for the results to be combined in such a way, if you will. And so from there, a summary with one mean effect size can result. So you see that rhombus there in the middle of the slide. That is our summary effect size, and it's represented in a rhombus. And you'll, you'll get to see that later in the course when we start looking at graphs and interpreting them, etc. But that's the little rhombus that we'll be looking for. And then we also look at whether within that pool of evidence and published literature, where the findings are consistent with one another or um, where they are inconsistent or very different from one another. And so if they are very different, which in psychological research, realistically, there are inevitably going to be differences and variability in what we're seeing, also known as heterogeneity. And so we're going to assess further to determine the potential sources of that inconsistency. All right. So now let's get into more of a stepwise progression of what we're doing at the ground level within those steps. All right. So first we have to identify a problem. This is the focus of week one in the course. So looking at what question needs to be answered in the available research that we have that's published. Second, so week two focus, is specifying the problem. So sometimes questions that we have might be too vague for us to actually answer them uh, through meta-analysis. And so what has to happen is we have to set parameters of relevant boundaries to specify the problem that's set out in order to be able to answer that question that we have. Then we have to develop a coding manual of the variables that we'd like to examine across all of the articles that we are going to pull. And then we have to specify what articles we have to include 
in order to determine what's going to be included and what's going to be excluded from the meta-analysis. So if there's any particular factor present, what is going to, um, what is that particular factor that then is going to exclude that article from the pile? So determining those inclusion and exclusion criteria so that those are firm and in place. And then once all of these items are in place, it's then time for us to conduct the meta-analysis. So we start with a comprehensive literature search. We use very specific terms that have been identified beforehand, which that'll be your next mini lecture is talking about how to search the literature and how to develop those terms. Um, and we identify those terms beforehand in order to ensure that all of the possible articles that exist on that particular topic are going to be retrieved from the databases that we're using. Okay. It's often that there are a huge number of articles that end up getting kicked back. And so from that initial pull that we do, not all of those articles are actually going to fit our criteria, our inclusion criteria to be included in the meta-analysis. So what has to happen is a review of all of those articles, however many hundred or sometimes thousand that could be. And so we do that in a very systematic way so that um, we can get through the pile in a reasonable amount of time, even though it is very time consuming to say the least. So we start with a title review. We can actually get rid of a bunch of articles that just have nothing to do with our topic based on the title alone that we can exclude those. Once we've gone through title, then we can review at the abstract level. And in a lot of instances, you can tell by reviewing the abstract if it's going to be a relevant study or if it can be eliminated. And then after we've done abstract review and we're left with full text level review, um, that is when we are actually using the coding manual and coding that full text in full. And after articles have been initially coded by one coder, in order to ensure that our results are going to be reliable, we will use what's called a blind coding process. And so this adds reliability to our findings. So essentially what this means is one person is going to code the articles without getting help from anybody else. And then a second person is also going to code those same articles without seeing what the first person coded and without getting help from anybody else either. So they're going to be coding blind from one another and they're going to hold on to their scores until they compare them at a later date. All right. And so after all of that coding process is complete, both initial and blind codes, you all come together as a group to have what's called an iterator reliability meeting or discussion. And this is where you essentially argue it out. Okay. So you discuss what codes you came to and when there are differences you will discuss you know how did I come to this particular code okay so um, and then you'll determine which is the final code that should be carried forward into the final coding that makes it into the database that then goes into the software for analysis all right and then finally once final codes are determined and argued out then the analyses are run with the final data in a meta-analysis specific software. So this is where it can get kind of challenging, and so I like to talk about this in the very first lecture. What research questions can and cannot be answered with meta-analysis? Remember that meta-analysis is um, going to seek to summarize and provide one effect size across a number of studies. These studies are going to have primary data, so essentially studies that reflect primary research, okay, folks who conducted their own research study. 
meta-analysis is actually a form of secondary research. Okay, so what, what we would be doing is summarizing other folks' research, if that makes sense. And so let's say that you have a research question, and it's really interesting, but it hasn't yet been researched in primary studies. That's fantastic, but unfortunately, until there is primary research that exists on that topic, you can't then try to answer that question through a meta-analysis. So in essence, what we can examine with meta-analysis is going to be limited based on what research has been conducted up to now in a particular topic area. All right, and so here's an analogy to kind of help further illustrate this concept. So take a look at the bottom right hand corner of this slide and you'll see these really happy penguins that are standing on the iceberg. And the small tip of the iceberg that you see above the water represents research that's available to us and has been examined directly. The remainder of the iceberg that's hidden below the water represents what we have not yet uncovered in research studies. And so while things may be possible to examine, they just haven't made it to the surface yet. So let's look at the issue of primary versus secondary research a little bit closer to ensure that we understand the difference between the two. All right. So primary research, we are looking at an individual study that someone conducted. So it's going to include participant level data. So an individual score, a group's score, things like that. Okay. Um, and it's going to include statistics that are typically multivariate. So we're going to see multiple uh, independent and dependent variables, uh, general linear model type things, etc. And secondary research, so meta-analysis, we are looking at things really from an aerial view. So we're looking at study level data, all right? So we are looking at a sample mean or a sample percentage of men, uh, ethnicity, things like that. Um, so we're looking at summary level data. And so we're going to be looking for statistics, like descriptive statistics, so means, standard deviations, things like that. And we're going to look for one effect size across studies. So let's take a look at some possible questions of what can be examined in a meta-analysis. Now, one of the most common questions in psychological research is, is X effective for Y? Okay, so put another way, what about looking at, is music therapy effective for folks who live with psychopathology? Is therapy effective for individuals who are diagnosed with binge eating disorder? Is therapy effective for older individuals living with depression? Okay, so those are examples of that type of research question. Another viable research question is looking at a relationship between two variables. So is there a correlation between X and Y? All right, so let's say we wanted to determine if there was any sort of relationship between PTSD and intimate relationship discord. We would be able to look at that, assuming that there's literature in that area, and there is. What if we also wanted to examine whether or not therapeutic alliance had a relationship with therapy outcome? So we would be looking at, are these two things in any way related to one another? And what does that look like in more detail? And then lastly, another common question is, you know, what is the prevalence of X in people with Y? So prevalence of pain in individuals diagnosed with bipolar disorder or things similar. Okay. So I want to end with talking about the different types of findings 
that actually lend themselves well to the format of meta-analysis, all right? So the first two on the left are actually the most common, okay? So pre-post contrasts and then group comparisons. So for pre-post contrasts, these are actually not the most robust and they aren't used all that often either. Okay, so this tends to be used when it's not morally or ethically sound to deny part of your group treatment. Um, so as an example, let's say that you wanted to look at individuals who present with suicidal thoughts and you tell them, okay, I need you to wait for about four months and sit here on our waitlist control group. And in the meantime, we're going to work with the people over here. The fact of the matter is, if we have folks that present with suicidal thoughts, we have to put them all in treatment. So the only thing that we can do in that type of situation is to look at their pre, uh, pre and post test scores and compare those. All right, there's just no way to get a comparable control group in this type of setup. The second type of findings is group comparisons. So we could be looking at, you know, control versus treatment. We could also be looking at one type of therapy versus another type of therapy. So the question you might have is, you know, does one of these two types of treatment prevail above the other? Is one more effective than the other? Something to that effect. The third type is frequency. So this doesn't come up as much, but where it does come up more commonly is actually in forensic populations if someone wants to look at recidivism rates. So you'll be counting, did they offend? Did they not reoffend? And with this methodologically, an ideal situation would be to look at control versus treatment. Uh, but ethically and morally, it's not always great or possible depending on the population that you're interested in examining. Because what primary researchers would essentially be saying is, you know, hey, let's make these offenders wait and release them to see if they go commit a terrible offense, potentially harming others. And so depending on the population, there may not be the possibility of a control group, or they do have a control group, but it's very specifically defined, and that's um, commonly defined across a number of studies in that way. The fourth type is central tendency. So in this instance, this is the only time where all of the studies that you would be looking at would actually use the same measure. Okay, so if we're going to be looking at a mean score we would have to use the same measure or else the score is not going to translate. Okay, so a mean of 12 on the Beck Depression Inventory, the BDI, is not going to mean the same as a mean of 12 on the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Inventory. Okay, but let's say that we're doing a group comparison. It's okay if they use different measures in that instance, because we'll actually combine them into a standardized effect size with some of those conversions that I talked about on the earlier slide. And then lastly, correlation or association between variables. So looking at whether or not two variables are related to one another, and we want to be looking at this relationship in more, in more detail, so the strength of that. So is it strong? Is it weak? Is it positive? Is it negative? What does that relationship look like in more detail? And that closes our first mini lecture for week one.